Yeah, Eric told me that he would be coming in uh, around 6 o'clock his time, I guess. Uh, tonight's study is one that is very interesting, I believe. Uh, at least to me it is. Because I, I think now I'm seeing, by God's grace, the missing link when it comes to uh, God, first of all, being the judge. And yet the judgment itself is delegated. And that's what we're going to look at in a study that I've labeled the judge versus the officer. Now this is continuing with the series uh, on church suicide. Oops, that didn't post. Hold on one second. We've been looking at church suicide and I believe that the Bible has a lot to say about God's judgment on the church, but the method of judgment, the way God goes about executing the judgment is through the locust. And that, again, I propose is very, very important. Uh, the moment that we are able to see this in the Bible, then it should open up a lot of other verses. So, I'll try and catch up, uh, or maybe recap just a little bit once Eric uh, comes in. In Psalm 9, verse 8. Psalm 9, verse 8. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. Now, we read a lot of verses in the Bible that God is a judge. Anyone here disagree with that? Anyone here disagree that God is the judge of all the earth. No. Because the Bible teaches that. Yeah. The Bible tells us again and again. You know, we, we but again, we, we have to keep in mind uh, that we need to compare the Bible with the Bible. We also read, for example, in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Now, God here again, He is saying that the believers will judge the world. Now that could have a double meaning because saints could be looking at <clears throat> in this context here I believe it is pointing to the elect because the latter part of the verse says and if the world shall be judged by you are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters. Um, actually this may carry both meanings still because God is concerned with the corporate church, the corporate body and they are referred to as saints, messengers, angels. And so the idea is God at this point, I believe, is not, or he may not be making a distinction between the wheat and the tares. That makes sense? So God is the judge, and we know that the believers judge with Christ. We read in uh, Matthew 19:28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, That ye which have followed me in the generation when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, so we do see again and again in the Bible that God speaks of judgment. And then he is the judge. God makes himself to be the judge. The believers assist in the judgment process. But the main question we, we want to try and uh, see if we can get the Bible to answer is how this judgment is carried out. Now if you consider the judicial process in any country really, any country, uh, first you have a judge. The judge hears the case and for the most part, I know today we have juries and juries are they deliberate and then they ultimately they decide on a guilty or a uh, innocent verdict but for the most part the judge is said to be the one passing judgment. Anyone disagree with that? So it is the judge. But let me ask you another question. What happens when the judge declares 
an individual guilty? Does the judge get up? Does, does he or she get up and put handcuffs on the individual and take him to the, uh, to the prison cell? Or if it's a death sentence, does a judge take on the responsibility of uh, administering the, uh, the lethal injection? Or if it's an electric chair, does the judge partake in any of that? No, not that I'm aware of, right? The judge is the main individual, the main person deciding whether or not to condemn but when judgment is passed the judge calls on someone else to administer the judgment and that's the point uh, again Lord willing I believe uh, that the Bible is making Matthew 12 41 the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So the believers, how are they judging with Christ? All right, now before we get into the, the delegation aspect uh, of these verses, let's uh, look at a couple of additional verses. Let's talk about the sword. What is the sword in the Bible? What is, uh, doesn't the Bible speak of the Word of God being a two-edged sword? It is God's Word. But yet again and again, we see God speaks of uh, bringing judgment with the sword. We read, for example, Revelation 19, verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Who's in view here? talking about Christ right notice how God says out of his mouth and that and that's one of the reasons why I think many people and that used to be the case with me you read these verses and then we begin to associate the judgment process uh, being executed by the believers by by the elect and many today you know they they, they say the exact same thing so they feel that they uh, they need to blanket the world because it is uh, the word that they speak that they claim to be truth to the Bible that's how the judgment is taking shape is that the case out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword the mouth of God and I think we're gonna see later on God uses this interchangeably the mouth of the wicked because it is God who is bringing judgment to pass he can also speak of it as the word is coming out of his mouth because God is still associated I believe with the church now even though it is Babylon the unsaved body has been cast out but the the idea is that God gives authority he gives power to the wicked to administer judgment to the church. Revelation 1 16 and he had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now I believe also that there is an element of judgment when the believers bring the message of uh, condemnation. Babylon has fallen come out over my people but that I propose again it's not the primary uh, judgment that is being trumpeted. When the believers share truth, and to the extent that God will allow, this brings the salvation aspect of the gospel to those that are yet to be redeemed from Babylon. Okay, so God speaks of a double-edged sword. Psalm 57 verse 4. My soul is among lions. And I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. So can you see how God, already in these verses, can we see that? That God is associating the tongue of the wicked with a sharp sword. And what is the sword in the Bible? 
again, it is the Word of God, but it's the Word of God that is being uh, mishandled or misused by the locust. So therefore, God is not blessing the Word, but it is still the Word of God when the false prophets, they come with lies that cannot save. The teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue is sharp sword. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 14. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords. You see, God is associating teeth, the mouth, with the sword, and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor of the earth. And this, I believe, took place at the start of the Great Tribulation when the two witnesses were killed. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 4. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Isn't that interesting? Who do you suppose is in view there? Her end is bitter as wormwood. Isn't the context talking about Babylon, the unsaved, the Jezebels? But you notice again that God is using the phrase two-edged sword in connection with wormwood. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. We know that for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Now God's word, it cuts unto judgment, but the same fire that judges the wicked, that judges Babylon, is the same fire that chastises and redeems the elect from tribulation. So it is a double-edged sword. But the judgment aspect of it, I propose again, it is coming from the wicked. From the wicked. Those that God delegates to execute judgment on the body. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's Christ. Christ is the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 14 Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts because ye speak this word behold I will make my words in thy mouth fire so there it is again can you see that I will make my words in thy mouth fire and this people would and it shall devour them isn't that interesting so there we have the mouth and we have the fire, but it's coming out of the mouth of the wicked. Let's see. One other verse here. Psalm 17, verse 13. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, thy sword. There it is. There it is, the wicked. God uses the wicked as a sword. Well, not just any sword, because the wicked, you know, a man's foe shall be there of his own household. The enemy comes from within. So the enemy are those, the unsaved in the church. And they come with a destructive gospel, which is how God sends a famine. And this gospel is meant to kill to destroy. Remember the pommel worm, the canker worm, the caterpillar? The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a flame burneth. And they are to destroy everything on their path. Okay, any questions so far? Any questions? We're looking at the judge versus the officer. And I'm offering here that when God speaks of judgment, He is the judge. But he declares someone guilty. And then he allows the adversary, the enemy, which is what we're going to look at here, the adversary that is Christ and the person of the locust. 
Remember that verse that says, Behold, I come as a thief. Christ comes as a thief, but he is not the thief. Well, yeah, again, that's because he allows the thieves, the locusts, the scorpions to destroy the body. That's how he is doing the judge, uh, the judging. He is not actively judging, but he passes sentence on the unsaved, the wicked in the body. And then he gives the body over to the enemy. Matthew 5, 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge. See that? That's Christ. That's God. And the judge deliver thee to the officer. So again, it's not the judge who is uh, getting up and uh, executing the judgment on the wicked. The judge delivers the guilty party to someone else. And thou be cast into prison. Exodus 23 verse 22. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. How does God become an adversary unto the adversary? How does that happen? Is God the adversary? Well, in a way, he is. God is the adversary if he allows the wicked to take hold of the unsaved body. He is faithful. Hi, welcome. That's how I propose God is the adversary. Looking at a Bible study that I've labeled Judge versus Officer. Looking at the process of judgment in the Bible, how God is the judge but he delegates authority to the officer, a third party, who is going to execute judgment. I will be an adversary unto thine adversaries. Any questions there? And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary... Your adversary, the devil. So who is the adversary? Who is the enemy? Well, one has to agree, you know, God calls himself an adversary. But again, it is in a sense that he can bring damnation to the unsaved when he forsakes the body. But he himself is not the one executing the judgment. And yet he calls himself an adversary. So one has to agree with the adversary. First of all, God calls for unity in the body of Christ. Uh, wheat and tares are growing together. And then, at the revelation of Christ, there is a separation. Take a look at Job chapter 16, verse 11. God hath delivered me to the ungodly. Well, Satan is the adversary, the devil, the ungodly. You notice here again that the whole basis of judgment is that God delivers. He delivers. God hath delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. So who is doing the judging? God is the judge. And who executes judgment? Who is the one that executes the judgment? It is the wicked, the officer, the ungodly, the adversary, the devil. We read also in Psalm 104, I'm sorry, 140 verse 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. So that's a prayer for salvation. Keep me from the unsaved. In other words, do not allow my soul to be subject to the, the locusts, the pastors, the false prophets. And how is God going to do that? Well, through revelation. When he unseals the Bible, that's the revelation of Christ. And that's how God keeps the believers, the elect body, from the hour of temptation, the hour of darkness. 
Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 34. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. Who are the tormentors? Remember the rich man and Lazarus? Send Abraham that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. For I am tormented in this flame. The rich man and Lazarus. Father Abraham. So, the object here, again, it is the fact that God delivers the wicked to the tormentors. And that would be the, the officer, the locusts, the thieves, the unsaved in the body. God forsakes the body. Okay, any questions here? We got two other uh, small sections to look at. Not a lot of verses. Any questions? Anything here not clear? Any uh, verses uh, you might want me to go over? Again. So hopefully, we might begin to see a pattern in the language of the Bible concerning the nature of the judgment. The judgment itself. Sentencing. Delivering to death after a guilty verdict. So there again, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11, because sentence against an evil deed, I'm sorry, sentence, sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Sentence, God passes judgment, he passes sentence when? When Christ is revealed, but before that, the church had to go through the tribulation. The believers were chastised. The unsaved uh, in the body, they rejoice over the killing of the two witnesses. Mark chapter 10, verse 33, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribe, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. You see there again, even with the judgment on Christ, Christ is given over. He is delivered to the people. To do what? To be condemned. But who allowed that to happen? Could God have stopped Christ from going to the cross? Could he have prevented him when Christ said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me? Did that, you know, God is the judge. Did he have the power, the ability to do that? Yeah, of course he did. But the fact that he allowed Christ to be taken, it shows us that it was the will of God. And it's the same thing I propose when it comes to God delivering the unsaved church uh, to the wicked. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 9. And I will bring you out of the midst thereof and deliver you into the hand of strangers. The hands of strangers. And will execute judgments among you. So, how is God judging the church? How is God judging the wicked? Is, is it the believers that are coming with the gospel? Is that how God is judging? No, that's not the main aspect of judgment I propose. It is the, the other way around. It's the wicked, the locust. God delivers the unsaved body into the hands of strangers so that they have no revelation. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 25. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life. So there it is again. <clears throat> and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, think back in the Old Testament, especially uh, in the book of Judges. What happened when the, the children of Israel, again and again, they rebelled, they disobeyed God? What happened? What did God do? Can anyone share their understanding of uh the, some of the, these accounts in the Old Testament. How did God bring judgment to the people? 
How did God bring judgment to the people? What happened? Isn't it true that God allowed the enemy, God allows the enemy, the Philistines or uh, the Babylonians, the outside nations, God allowed them, he gave them a, a, a way to come into the city and they began to destroy. Can you see a parallel there? It's the same thing. So God's method of judgment is the fact that he allows the enemy to come against the body. Now in the case of the church and tribulation, the enemy comes from within. So we're not looking for uh, the outside nations to come against Jerusalem. God allows wicked men to come into yeah, praise God, very nice. God allows wicked men to come into the church. They become a part of the congregation. They identify with Christ. They come in the name of Christ. And God allows these wicked men, the, the pastors, the uh, deacons, or what have you, anyone coming in the name of Christ, if they're not faithful to the whole counsel of God, then God uses them and they can have a, a tremendous amount of authority. They can be well-spoken, uh, very convincing in the message that they share. But again, if God is, is not working uh, with these individuals, then he is using them as the enemy. <clears throat> he is allowing them to further bring the church into darkness. And then the believers, when God... Uh, Christ unseals the Bible. Now they understand time and judgment, which is why they are commanded to come out of Babylon. Second Corinthians chapter one verse nine. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. The believers, they too, they came into this time of judgment. God is not judging them. They are chastised in tribul not after the tribulation. You know, there are some today that are speaking of uh, chastising or testing after the tribulation. Where do we see that in the Bible? Everything that has to do with the believers enduring, it is the fact that they go through the tribulation. It has to do with the killing of the two witnesses. After the tribulation, you know, the Bible says... A weeping endures for a night. That's the great tribulation. The night cometh when no man can work. It transitions into the complete devastation of the body, of the church. A weeping endures for a night. But what comes in the morning? Joy. Not grief. Not testing. Not salvation. The believers are not being tested enough anymore because God already tried them in the fire. The day and the hour. It starts with the great tribulation and transitions into the death of Babylon. So we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Uh, okay, and then finally, let's take a look at the executing officer, Satan, the false prophets. Job chapter 2, verse 6. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand. Can you see again? I mean, it's very hard to miss if you think about it. The Bible is replete. It, it, it has a lot to say on the method, the way God goes about judging. Now, in this context here, Job is typifying the elect. I believe, coming into the Great Tribulation. God gives Job over to the wicked, to Satan. And that's why he suffered uh, persecution. Uh, he was chastised. He lost everything. And that, again, is a picture of the church in Tribulation. And then God redeemed Job. He redeems the church at the revelation of Christ. And then he receives double, a language of salvation. John chapter 7 verse 32 the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him it's all about sending a third party 
Now in this context here, even the Pharisees and Sadducees, they typify the unsaved in the body. And this brings us right into the, the, uh, the aspect of uh, God's judgment is that the church destroys the church. John chapter 19 verse 6, When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. So we're looking at the officers. Remember the judge delivers you to the officers when God finds someone guilty. John chapter 18 verse 3, Judas, here's another one typifying the unsaved church, having received the ban of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So these officers, the the band of men, they come to take Christ, just like the unsaved church came to take the body of Christ in tribulation. Matthew 26, verse 58, almost done. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants. That's another name for officers. And God speaks of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, as his servant. Jeremiah 27, verse 6. I, and now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. So you see, when God brings the wicked on the church, the unsaved in the body, they are his messengers, his servants that he uses to execute judgment to allow the church to destroy itself summary conclusion let me see if I can uh, wrap this up oh, hold on one second if the Bible therefore appears to be confirming yet you know, we've looked at some of these verses before and I'm only finding, by God's grace, confirmation that that is what the Bible is teaching. The Bible appears to be confirming once again that the judge, that is Christ, executes judgment on the unsaved church by delivering it into the hands of its enemy. That's the false prophets. But just like any system of, ju of justice, the judge passes sentence but the sentence itself is carried out by an officer or someone who is designated to see it through, to carry it out. Isn't that interesting? So that's what I'm offering here. That's what I believe uh, the Bible to be teaching concerning uh, how God brings the church under judgment. Uh, bear with me one second.